What makes us human? It's a big question. Is it our language, our intelligence, or even something as simple as our thumbs? Sure, something has to separate us from our slightly dimmer ape cousins. And ever since Darwin popularised the idea of natural selection and evolution, academics have been arguing about what made humans so unique and dominant. Proposed theories include man the hunter, man the runner, and even man the aquatic ape? But today we're going to look at a theory put forward by primatologist Richard Wrangham, man the cook. Could something like cooking have really given us the evolutionary advantage needed to transform from ape into human? Let's find out. We are the only species that cooks our food. Language, intelligence and thumbs can be found in other species across our planet, but only humans get pizza. It's a common belief that cooking is a recent invention, something Homo sapiens invented after already assuming our modern evolutionary form. We imagine our natural diet as one of raw meat, fruit and vegetables, not unlike that of chimps. The core belief of the raw foodist movement is that we'd be a lot healthier if we only ate raw food. Can we actually survive on raw food though? There are medieval reports of Mongol soldiers riding for weeks without starting a single fire, draining blood from their horses for sustenance or throwing a chunk of meat under their saddles in the morning, which friction would tenderize for their evening meal, thus inventing steak tartare. This raw diet obviously didn't have any negative effects on Mongol soldiers, judging by their ability to literally conquer all the things. Many people tout this as an example of the strength of the raw food diet, forgetting that as soon as they stopped riding, the Mongols were just as eager as anyone to partake in a nice Mongolian barbecue. The Mongols may prove that we can survive on a raw food for some time, but Rangan believes that we evolved to eat cooked food. So let's look at an experiment conducted by the BBC in 2006. They took 9 dangerously unhealthy people, stuck them in an enclosure in Peyton Zoo, and only fed them raw fruit, veg, nuts and a small amount of cooked fish. They all ate their recommended caloric intakes between 2 and 2300 calories. For the participants, the results were great. Their blood pressure fell to normal levels and they lost an average of 4.4 kilos each. This is great for modern, overweight people. But if our ancestors ate such a high quality diet, took in all their needed calories and still lost weight, it would be devastating from an evolutionary standpoint. Chimps would have grown fat on this diet. Why didn't humans? Well, for one, Raw food diets always result in weight loss. Among people that eat raw food diets, one third show signs of chronic energy deficiency. In female raw foodists, 50% stop menstruating, which, while protecting them from bears, has serious fertility consequences. Now, this isn't an attack on the raw food diet, as it's a diet many people enjoy. However, its effects will be horrible for a population of our hunter-gatherer ancestors. Just from an evolutionary standpoint, reduced fertility in those eating raw food diets would have given those eating cooked food a bit of a baby making advantage. We lose weight on raw food diets because cooked foods provide more energy calorie wise, and energy gain is our primary reason for eating. You may be wondering why cooked foods provide more energy, and they do so because reducing the size of food particles through crushing and grinding or by softening them through cooking makes them easier to digest. Hard foods are, predictably, harder to digest meaning that you need to use more energy to break them down. We even have research proving this and it's really cool. Japanese scientists gave 10 rats ordinary food pellets, which require a, a fair amount of chewing. They gave another 10 rats the exact same pellets, except this time they had been softened by increasing their air content. Everything else in the rats lives stayed the same. After 32 weeks, the soft pellet rats were an average of 37 grams heavier and had 30% more abdominal fat. This is enough to classify them as obese. The soft food was easier to digest, so the rats didn't have to expend as much energy digesting their food, resulting in a net energy gain. Okay, so cooking food gave our ancestors more energy. What does that mean exactly? Well first we'll have to look at something called an evolutionary trade-off. In order to increase one trait, you need to decrease another. Ostriches are excellent runners at the expense of flying, turtles have protective shells but sacrifice mobility, and giraffes have very long necks, but that makes it difficult to buy scarves. During our evolution there was a digestive evolutionary trade-off. Compared to the other apes we have tiny mouths, stomachs, guts and colons, along with some weak jaws. Wrangham speculates that as our ancestors started eating cooked foods every day, natural selection began to favour those with smaller and less demanding guts. 
Digestion can require as much energy as movement does, so those with smaller guts wasted less energy digesting their food. Therefore, smaller guts provided an energy surplus. Our guts are 40% smaller than would be expected in a primate of our size. So what do we trade our digestive systems for? You probably guessed it, bigger brains. Primates with smaller guts have bigger brains on average. Our big brains were paid for by our small guts. This idea is known as the expensive tissue hypothesis. Wrangell suggests that by using this hypothesis, we can assume that Homo erectus came about because of cooking. His reasoning is that before 2 million years ago, there is no evidence of the controlled use of fire. And after 2 million years, there are three major changes that result in a new species of Homo. Homo erectus, 1.8 million years ago, Homo heidelbergensis, 800,000 years ago, and Homo sapiens, 200,000 years ago. He rules out the changes from erectus to heidelbergensis and from heidelbergensis to sapien because the changes are just too small to indicate a massive change in diet because they were mostly physical changes to the face and brain enlargements. So the only remaining option really is the shift from our ape-like ancestors Homo habilis into Homo erectus 1.8 million years ago. To understand why Wrangham pinpoints this shift as the origin of cooking, we need to take a closer look at both species. Homo habilis were much better climbers than Erectus was. They were much smaller, standing at around 1.2 meters, and had much bigger teeth than any other species of Homo, indicating that they chewed a lot. Habilis is so ape-like that there's actually disagreement on whether they should be classified as a species of Homo. Now, let's look at Homo erectus. With their evolution, we see the largest reduction in tooth size, the largest increase in body size, and the loss of shoulder and arm adaptations that helped us climb. Erectus had a smaller gut and a larger brain, 42% larger to be exact. Erectus were also the first species of Homo to spread out of Africa. So these reductions in tooth and gut size, along with the ability to move into unknown habitats, show that Erectus clearly developed some new way of extracting energy from its environment, and Wrangham suggests that it was cooking. Now that Wrangham has shown that cooking may have transformed our ape bodies into modern human ones, he goes on to explain how it influenced our minds and societies. Let's just look at some of the examples he gives. 1. Chewing Raw food takes forever to chew. Chimps in Tanzania spend more than 6 hours a day chewing. It's like their full-time job. Humans, by comparison, spend very little time chewing. If we had to eat like chimps, it's estimated that we would spend 42% of our day chewing. Currently, it takes less than 5% of our day. This left us with a lot more time to hunt, invent, and uh, make more people. 2. Weaning Babies are weak and they constantly keep trying to die. Their teeth are essentially useless and they can't chew anything solid for years. But softening food allowed us to switch from milk to solid food much earlier, giving us access to more energy and ensuring a healthier development. 3. Nudity Fur keeps animals warm and negates the need for pants. Humans, however, are naked and require pants. This is fire's fault because fire gave us the ability to stay warm, so those with less fur didn't freeze to death. And luckily enough, they actually got this new ability to run farther without overheating, which resulted in them being better hunters and passing their genes on successfully. Because everyone knows, the true way to a woman's heart is to kill and butcher a large African land mammal and present it to her. Love. And that's how cooking made us human. The biological benefits of cooking our food forged the bodies and minds we needed to become highly intelligent and social creatures. And the rest is history. If you found this video entertaining, I would highly recommend you go check out this video by Smart by Design. It's about why humans evolved bipedalism, and it's a fascinating video. Click on that little eye in the top corner and it'll bring you right to his video. I really recommend you subscribe because he puts out some great content. Now, this is only one hypothesis out of many on how humans evolve. I included what I think are Richard Rangham's strongest points from his book, Catching Fire, How Cooking Made Us Human. Others I left out because I either find them unconvincing, such as his theory on the evolution of marriage, and others were left out because it would just make for a really long video. But I do recommend you go check out his book. There is a link in the description, along with links to the t-shirt store and to all of the other sources I use in this video as well. So thanks for watching, and I hope you enjoyed the video.